One, two, one, two.
party on the 31st. There's a bag for sweets. And I've still forgotten mine, sorry. Um, <laughs> I bought them. They just sat there and I haven't brought them in. So we've got light party on the 31st. If you know anybody, do encourage them to book. We've got the parenting course starting on the 7th of November. Obviously, we've got Jack and the Beanstalk. And we have got... Oh, no, that's the other thing. Yeah, these leaflets. So, they've all been bundled up. Lee has been very busy and bundled them up in streets for us. Um, because we really don't know how many people out there know that we're here. So, we're trying to make a bit more of an impression um, they, so that they know where we are. So, we want to raise the profile. And so, the idea is we're going to go out posting the flyers through the door. Um, Mike has suggested that we pray before we go out and maybe ask for opportunities for those conversations um, which are more memorable than a flyer. So please, if you can help, they're all on the back and there's a list to sign up on your name. If you want some for your street and your street isn't down there, then do sign up and say that you're taking them and which road you're taking them for. I think that is about it. Oh, no. I forgot this morning, so I have to send an email out. But next Sunday, the clocks go back. So if you come at your normal time, it'll probably be an hour early and you could help set up. But other than that, the clocks go back next Sunday. So I will send an email to remind anybody. Thank you. When do the clocks go back? Next week. All right. Uh, let's start our worship with our first song, uh, Cross Our Hope in Life and Death.
Well, today, not differently, but today, Roslyn and I had a really good time with some really good friends, and it was a sort of short notice thing. Um, and it was real fellowship. It was really, really good to spend time together. And that word fellowship can actually be translated communion. And so for a period of time today, we communion together. And as you can see, part of the, today's meeting, this evening's meeting, is that we're going to share communion together. And there's something about having a meal. And Jesus used a meal to bring us something really, really precious and important. The two things that he gave us as ordinance, baptism and communion. And tonight, again, we're going to be able to share that together. Um, I want you to turn to 1 John, if you want to do that. It's going to be um, up on the screen. So in the NIV, we read the translation, fellowship. But I also want you to think when I say fellowship, communion, as we go through the passage. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship, communion with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is an actual statement of truth. This is what has happened. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us uh, our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. An atoning representation of what Christ has done is a wonderful picture and I was reminded today, we were reminded today as we fellowship together, what a wonderful thing it is to have communion with Christ and in that way as believers have communion with each other. It was a real joy. Uh, we're going to move to our second song now uh, and we're going to sing two songs together after which I'm going to pray. After I've prayed, Sophie will come and share a reading. And we'll go straight into um, our next song after Sophie has read. So, uh, Living Hope, How Great the Chasm.
Thanks so much for that. That's a tremendous line, isn't it? Eternity's been won for us. But what is eternity? It's spent with God for the believer. That's what eternity is. Fantastic. We don't even know part of that yet. Okay, let's, uh, let's come to prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that it's possible to come to you. <coughs> we thank you that we can enter your courts. We thank you that we can stand at the throne and ask. You cover us. You cover our sin. You forgive us our sin because of Christ. And we stand in that confidence and in that blessing that only stand in him, clothed in his righteousness. And Father, we, we ask for the sin of our own lives. We thank you for Christ dealing with that. And Lord, as we know only too well our own weakness, we continue to sin. And as we go through life, the more minute of how sin works in our life becomes apparent to us. And so, Lord, we thank you and continue to ask for your forgiveness. Father, we thank you that there's no other name given by which we must be saved, by who we serve. This morning we were hearing about the glory, your glory, and those wonderful pictures that were put up uh, in an artistic way of trying to capture in some way of what it might be looking like to be in your presence. And Father, we thank you that it's not all roads and that you're not a God. Father, we thank you for the truth that you are God. You are, I am and Father, we thank you for your sustenance for us. <coughs> we thank you that you feed us spiritually. We thank you that you lead us. We thank you for the believer that there was a time in our life when you didn't just uh, make yourself known, but you came fully through to fully fill us. That you gave us the bread of life that we needed, and you continue to do that. And we praise your name for that. And Father, we thank you for that story of deliverance. We thank you for the word history is his story. God, it's your story. It's Christ's story. And we stand in the story. And we thank you that we have an identity in you. And Lord, we ask that you'll make us strong and courageous to stand for you. We thank you that you yourself are glorified and that your Son is glorified and that the Holy Spirit that indwells every believer, for me, is glorified. <coughs> and Father, we do ask for the things that are around us, the things of everyday life. Father, we thank you that we can share in the joy that joy now experiences, Lord, but we stand alongside silently with her family. And for each of us who knew her well, those who knew her so much better than me, and Lord, we look forward to Thursday of being able to celebrate the life that she had in you, that she only pointed to you, that all who knew her knew who her saviour was and in whom her confidence was. But Lord, we do ask for comfort to the family. We ask for comfort to those who mourn her. And uh, we thank you that the reason we mourn her is because of her standing in you and shining for you. Lord, we pray for our king as he becomes more high profile as he does this uh, trip to uh, Australia, Lord. Uh, we ask that you will have worked in him and that his representation uh, of royalty will influence others around for good. And Lord, we don't always know or understand where he stands before you, but we know his position. 
And so we ask that that position might be one of glorifying you. We pray for our Parliament, Lord, as they make decisions, decisions that are being made that uh, we will shake our heads at and suck through our teeth. But Lord, we ask for wisdom. We ask for the believers that are in government. We ask that those who have positions of a voice within Parliament, within the enemy's chambers, will be able to share the glorious gospel that might influence decisions that stand for you, Lord. And Father, we pray for all of your servants. We pray for all those gathered here tonight, uh, those who are gathered throughout this area, uh, who also are believers that meet in your name and seek to serve you. And Lord, we ask that you'll uh, give us uh, a real sense of purpose and a desire to serve and reach out to our community. Father, we have these leaflets. Lord, we ask that we wouldn't just drop but we'd be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in us and be ready to receive all those who respond to those leaflets and join us. And as we uh, interact with one another, Lord, we ask that the love that we shared today would be also shared at all times and in all circumstances through our fellowship together. And Father, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now our Sophie to come and read and uh, following that uh, we'll be singing you laid aside your majesty and then our brother Stephen's going to come and share with us Sophie so tonight we're reading from 1 Peter 1 Peter and it is page 1217 in the church bibles Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who, having been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith and the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophet who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. But when they spoke of the things that they have now been told by you, by those, things, those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. 
Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the, these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love, for one, another, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and, are, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good.
I'm just going to focus on um, three verses tonight. Uh, 1 Peter, uh, 1, um, sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, so those of you that know me well know that if I've picked a really long reading that I'm going to cover, you're all right, and I'll just be sort of vague and something. If I'm focusing in on a few verses, um, strap in uh, would be my recommendation for that. Uh, a bit of context, thank you Jackie for reading uh, that through. Uh, our passage that we're looking at tonight starts therefore. Sorry, Sophie, you read this morning, didn't you? <laughs> that I liked. Um, I felt, I felt Sophie's just phoning it in. Uh, no, sorry, uh, Sophie, thank you for, for doing the, uh, the reading. Um, just, uh, I was at Messy Church this afternoon. Um, so if I start talking about Jesus being the light of the world, uh, I've also drifted off into that talk as well. Um, so so um, our passage we're looking at uh, tonight, um, the verse um, uh, in chapter 2, start therefore. So, so I think it's important that we've read the bit before, because we're talking about therefore. Because of what we've just done, this is, this is what we're going to do. Um, so Christians um, have a new identity. It's basically summing up what that starts. And that starts with with looking at Peter. So so Peter was this fisherman, but he starts the letter not, Hi, I'm the local fisherman, would you like to buy any fish? He's lost that identity, he says, Peter, an apostle of Christ Jesus. He has this new identity that he's taken on, that he embraces. And I love the Peter story, the journey he goes through, the, the challenges that he does to Jesus, where he sort of corrects Jesus a couple of times and then actually just gets totally wiped out and has to pick himself back up. And, and he's embraced that identity. And, and these verses in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, it, it challenges us to do our identity, to find our new identity in Christ, which means that we need to be holy. To be different, to be set apart, not live as the way this world lives, but to to live differently. And then it goes on to to phrase this, because we're not in the same family that we were in before. We're we're born again. We're we're born differently to how we were before. Because we have been born again. Uh, In verse uh, 23, uh, 24 and 25... We have this phrase unpacked for us, uh, it's born again, uh, not of perishable seed, but imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. And then we have this really interesting um, phrase. For people are like grass, and all their glories, or all their glory, is like the flowers in the field. Just, just to put that in context, all of the human achievement, the pyramids, the Great Wall, you know, the NHS, all of the one... I know some of you have got issues with NHS, but try living in a country that doesn't have it, then come back for a bit and we'll just all moan together, okay? You know, it is, you know looking after things, you know, all of our, the glories that we have are, are just like the, the wild flowers. They're there for a bit, have their season, and, and then just die off. Or, or they're like the council verge, with all these beautiful flowers, and the mower just comes through one day, mows it all down, and it's just duff. Now, what are they compared and contrasted to? It's not, interestingly, compared to God, is it? And you can almost understand that as a concept. Well, you know, human achievements are like flowers. They're pretty, but they're not like, compared to the eternal God. But it's not compared to God. It's compared to his words. Now, if you weren't at messy church this afternoon, those words are gone. I've spoken them. The people that were there may have heard them, may have listened to them, they may remember them. They might not have even been paying attention because they were too busy doing some of the activities we had. But they're gone. I mean, this is recorded, so you can watch it back online. And, and, but if it's not, if, if words aren't recorded, the, the words are just gone. But the whole, the glory of human achievement, the best of us, it, it is like the grass and the wildflowers compared to just the words of God. But just to be clear, this isn't anything new. It's not anything new I'm saying. It's not anything new when Peter writes it. This is what the gospel's been about. 
being holy, being set apart, being different, living differently to this world, being born again, being into God's chosen family, it, it is what the gospel has gone out. Knowing that we're not equal to God is not something that Christians suddenly got a word. You know, Lewis talked this morning about holy, holy, holy. The Old Testament is full of this imagery of God being this amazing God and humans being this this separate thing that, that's not worthy to come into his presence. So the amazingness of the gospel is that those two things are still true. The fallen, sinful creation gets to call the creator father because of what Jesus has done on the cross. That's the amazingness of the gospel. Despite the fact we're nothing compared to God's words even, God knows us and he loves us anyway. And he's called us to follow him. Those of us that know and love him as our Lord and Saviour. Now, our, our verse after the word there says, you know, rid. Rid. So to rid ourselves is to, is to get free from. So, so I'm talking to people who, who claim to follow Christ Jesus, who, who have been freed from their sin and would call themselves Christians. So, so the idea is that God has set us free. So I want you to imagine, I don't know if they still do it in cartoons. Do you remember, the, um, I have to, when I talk to young people, I try and explain what I'm talking about. But you're, you'll know, because you, you know, you've seen the same programmes that I've seen. Maybe not you, Janet, but I'm sure they have these on the BBC as well, right? You know that image you get in old-fashioned films where they used to have like a big concrete weight and then a chain to their ankle. And, you know, they could move with it if they sort of carried the concrete weight with them. And if they put it down, they had sort of freedom for a metre or so. But actually running away would have been impossible. Now, I'm not great at uh, some bits of history. I'm not great at the other bits as well either. But I don't know whether they actually existed. But in my mind, they, they were all over the place in certain times in history. This, this sort of weight where you're tethered to. So, so imagine that Christ has come along and that, that weight, that tether is our sin. And Jesus freed us from that. What Peter is saying is that as we've walked away from that, we've chucked on a load of other stuff. So we're not free to run, we're not free to go where, where Jesus wants us to, because we've added stuff onto our lives that's weighing as much as what we were doing before. So Peter is calling us to rid ourselves of these things. Well, why? Why does Peter care? Well, the next verses that I didn't have Jackie read... Uh, my father-in-law spoke on a few weeks ago. It talks about us being built into a, to a living temple. So, so Christ, yes, he's the cornerstone, but we're the stones who are going to be built into this living temple. Okay? So, so the stones need to kind of be the right shape to go into the, into the, into the thing. And here's the thing. If God wants you in a certain place, you, you're going there, so what Peter's basically saying is, look, rid yourself of these, get yourself into the right shape. Because if we do it, that's, that can be quite an, a painless experience. But if God has to do these things for us, he'll do it with a chisel, or a pruning shear is the imagery that in the Gospels, and chop off the dead wood and make sure that we, that we flourish. So, so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we need to do something to earn our salvation. I'm not saying that in any way, shape or form. Christ has done the work so we can be followers of him. But what Peter is saying to us is we're going to be built into this living temple. If we want to be useful, the right shaped stones, we need to get rid of some certain stuff. Uh, the next section uh, um, that I want to just focus on is it's yourselves. It's not yourself. It, it's yourselves, plural. This is something we need to do together. I'm just going to caveat that in the context of Matthew 7, 3 to 5. Matthew 7, 3 to 5 is some of the most absurd part of the Bible you'll hear. But not absurd, ridiculous, but absurdity for a point. Now, I'm really sorry, Joe and Eileen, but you're, you're the closest people to me, so you're going to have to feature in this illustration. Okay. So let's say Joe was doing some carpentry, okay? Not, not totally out the realms of possibility, is it? Joe's doing some carpentry. Uh, and he, he gets a splinter 
in his eye. And uh, my name's on the first aid list out there. So I, I said, why are we doing carpentry while I was preaching, Joe? It's really inconsiderate. But, but Joe's got a splinter in his eye, and um, I've decided I can remove that splinter uh, for him. Okay? Seems like a perfect, reasonable thing to do. I've got a steady pair of hands. Eileen doesn't trust herself to do it. Um, she says, my eyesight's not good enough anymore, Steve. Could you remove the splinter from Joe's eye? Okay? In this imagery... I go over to remove this splinter from Joe's eye very carefully, and I've got a whopping great big plank out of my eye. Okay? And that's a ridiculous image, isn't it? I couldn't even get close enough with my arms to reach Joe, let alone get close enough to see to remove the splinter from his eye. If there was a plank in my eye, to try and remove the splinter from Joe's is a ridiculous concept. Now, fortunately, Joe is very patient. And he's happy for me to remove the, the plank from my own eye, presumably wait for that to heal so I can see properly again, and then have a bash at his eye. That's the, that's the image here. Remove the plank from your own eye so you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's. It's not just go away and sort yourself out. Remove the plank from your own eye and leave them to get an eye infection and work out. It doesn't say, or leave that for Mike to pop round and remove the splinters. He's got no planks in his eye at all. No, that's not the concept. The concept is that we are in it together and we are to work with each other. It, it's us together who are doing this. So what is it we are to be doing? Well, we're to rid ourselves of uh, malice. Now, as we go through these, I should just caveat, how they affect us all is going to depend on our personality. And it's not a tick list of, well, I never feel malice. That's not my one. They'll be different for different people, won't they? Different things will, will impact us. Different things will, will tell us. What works for you might not work for me. Um, some people just, you know, oh, take a deep breath and walk away. That, well, that might not be what's suitable for you. So just be aware that I'm not going to be trying to be too prescriptive. I'm just going to try and generally highlight what we need to be thinking about, what we need to be working on. And remember, the goal is that we may be useful spiritual stones to be built into Christ's church. And I think for, uh, for us here at AEC, that's a really useful thing to think about. As we're looking at going forward as a church, being a useful stone in that process it is, it is something we need, to, we need to work on. Because the church is, is the people. And if the people are right, and if the relationships with the people are right, and we're right because we're close to following Jesus and united with him, the rest of it we can just work with, we can come up with. But if we're not right, if there's something in us that, that's wrong, if there's, if there's stuff in us that's not good, then we're going to be dodgy shaped stones. After the message church, we put some um, mega blocks out and the kids are building some stuff. And I was talking to one of the fathers who brought his kids along and, and I was saying, you know, oh, do you not want to get into, oh, I've had enough of mega blocks at home, I'm happy just to sit here. I said, like, I have an issue with mega blocks, okay? My kids were taught to play with mega blocks properly. Because um, some kids don't. Joe, they line the bricks up, not staggered. So there's a fault line all the way through. And they just wobble the towers along. This kid's tower's wobbling like this, and he's really happy with it. I didn't go over and kick it down and say, look at there's no... But, you know, you've got to build mega block properly, or it's not, it's not worth, worth doing. But if we're not, if we're not building on the foundation of Christ, if we're not getting the right-shaped blocks into our church, ultimately we're going to be that wobbly tower that that kid... And eventually, when he put one too many blocks on, it fell over onto the child next to him. Which is funny in mega blocks context, but devastating in a church. So, so rid yourself of malice. Now, I don't know if all of you are on Facebook. Some of you are. Some of the victual, the malice, the, the horribleness that's on Facebook. If we were to be a church who were radically different in how we communicated in our community, that would be so effective. 
If we were to be Christians on our Facebook feeds, didn't get sucked into this maliceness, this horribleness, this, this evil way of communicating with people, that would be such a tremendous witness to our communities. See, removing this malice, removing this personal, spiteful, hateful attack, it is so important. Not, not to our witness, but also to how we, we, we treat people in the church. I want you to imagine there's two kids talking and they're being really horrible about someone. And as I stand behind them, I realise, well, the person they're being really rude about or mean to is one of my daughters. And if I said to them, excuse me, that's my daughter you're talking about. They're, I'm six foot one. There are very few little girls that would not go, oh no. But when you talk about fellow Christians, Jesus is looking at, that's my bride you're talking about. God is there saying, that's my child you're talking about. So we need to be really, really careful how we communicate with and to other Christians. And it should be radically different than we see around us. Rid yourself of hypocrisy. If you want to be an effective church, if we want to be effective Christians, hypocrisy will kill evangelism quicker than anything else I know. If you stand up on a Sunday and say, love your neighbour, and then you're horrible to your neighbour each week, that message will spread around the community quicker than you can stop it. If you call people to give generously, and then you're a tight church, they, and that message is going to spread. If you claim to have love one for another, but you can't be bothered to get out and help each other, huh? that is going to spread like a wildfire in the community. Do you know Why? Because the itching ears want to hear those stories. Every time a minister is accused of, of running off with someone and having an affair, it will gain traction and it will get, and, and not wrongly. But the three, four hundred other ministers who have faithfully served their communities for the whole of their 80 years of life that pass quietly into their funerals will not gain the same traction. Why? Because people want to point hypocritically at the church. They want to do it. And it's been the shame of the church over many years that sometimes they cover things up. They have hidden things when they should have stood up and said, that's not right, and it shouldn't happen in our house. We need to cut out hypocrisy. We need to say what we believe in the pulpit, and we need to live it out during the week. Very pleased when I found this picture. We need to rid ourselves of all deceit. We need to be people who, who, who aren't based on lies. Now, this comes back to the personality thing I was talking about. I mean, some of you won't lie. And the reason you don't lie is because you're rubbish at it. Okay? Not, not, not maybe from a moral point of view, but you're really bad at it. When you want to say yes... Um, you go, yes, and everybody, even like the little kids are kind of, they're lying, they're lying, I can see it, they're lying. You know, your, your parents and your husband, whatever, has always been able to do. So, so you don't lie because you're, you're rubbish at it, but some of us will be very skillful. Some of us will be very, very quick to lie. C can come up with a bit of lying, can come up with a, with a story. And then there's a real temptation, isn't there, when somebody says, you know, oh, what do you think? Oh, I haven't got time to discuss that now. I've got time to discuss it, but maybe I can say I don't have time to discuss it because I want to dodge the issue. Maybe, maybe it, it, it's, it's, oh, oh, we'll save their blushes. Sometimes you need to be wise in what you say, but sometimes we lie to avoid difficult conversations, tough conversations, conversations that we should be having with our friends and neighbours wisely, sensibly, grace fields, but let's not be people who dodge it. Sometimes we lie openly, and sometimes it's by what we don't say. We just deceive people because we don't actually speak what we, what we believe. We need to rid ourselves of deceit. 
We also need to rid ourselves of envy. I- individually, if we, if we envy what other people have, but also if we envy as a church, oh, we want to be like, that church seems to have lots of people. Or oh, that church is seeing different, different growth. The thing about envy is this. All the time you say, I need that, what you're saying is, you haven't got sufficient. If you sing and you pray and you read, Christ is sufficient for me, he's all I need, he's all I want, and then you covet something else, what you're saying is Christ isn't enough for you. You're saying Christ isn't sufficient for you. Now there are times where we're told to be discontented, when we walk past people who are homeless, people who are starving, people who are hungry, people who are victims, people who are abused. We are not to be comfortable with that concept. Jesus wasn't, and nor should we. But we are to be people who are content. The minimum standard that Paul puts out is really low, isn't it? It's like a spare coat, somewhere to sleep, and some food. I mean, that's it. We probably put the bar up a little bit higher than that. But we should find our contentment in Christ alone. We should find it in him and not envy what other people have. And that will be, again, dependent on your personality, won't it? It's really, it's really good being a person that lives in England because you can find people who are richer than you and therefore you've got you know, no money and you can sulk about that. But also you can look to the other side of you and find people who are a lot poorer than you are and then you can moan that you know, no one's giving to them over there. You know, being stood roughly in the middle where we are, you, you, can, you can look down on people from one way and you can look up at people on the other and you can be discontented either way. Or you can know that Christ is sufficient for you You're where he wants you to be and you can serve him and love him where you are. I will caveat that. I don't know your your relationships. There are certain things that I wouldn't want you to go home to and hear that I've said it's okay to happen. So there are certain relationships that some bad behaviour needs to stop and I'm not, I'm not justifying that from the pulpit and I don't want anyone to hear go home and meet your abuser because that's okay, that's not right and if they're going through that, please reach out to someone. What I am saying is, as Christians, we should not envy others, we should find our sufficiency in Christ. Although if he could give me a little bit more battery power on this, that would be helpful as well. Thank you, Lord. Um, And then we need to rid ourselves of slander of every kind. Rid yourself of slander of every kind. I did one of those sort of word things with all of the words that are close to to slander and, and going around. But it's so easy as a Christian, isn't it, to say, oh, we're not gossiping. We're sharing for prayer. And it is difficult, isn't it? If we're working on these things together, how do we call someone on their inappropriate behaviour without being, without being slanderous? Well, actually, they're really, really good, helpful ways in the Bible of how to communicate with each other. It talks about approaching people and talking directly to them and calling them on what they've done. It it talks about, if that doesn't work, maybe taking one other person with you and trying to win them back to explain to them what the the situation is. But I wonder if we've moved away from that and got into our society system, which is just to say something nasty about them to someone that you like. To talk about them behind their back with actually no production or or, or helpful counsel to just check that you're, am I I thinking the right thing? Is their behaviour inappropriate? But no plan to actually move forward with it, just 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 to moan and slander and gossip about it. If people in the church are upsetting us, if the way they're doing things aren't helpful to us, we should be able to talk to them. And people that are up the front, people that are involved in stuff, people that are responsible for things, should be able to listen.
two incidents I had with Joyce Brown, and um, I, I, I preached a sermon. She came up to me afterwards, and she said, Stephen, one thing. Don't be so flippant. I felt about that big. I was like, big. Next service, about three months later, the computer went wrong. And it was all glitching and it was horrible. And it was basically the little laptop we had at the time was that there, it wasn't like the big computer we've got now. It was a laptop and it was struggling to do what it was supposed to do. And it was dying. And then John was having a really bad time. And she came up to me afterwards and said, Stephen. I said, yeah. She said, that wasn't very glorifying, was it? I said, no. She said, you know, we can't have non-Christians coming in and seeing the technology and all that sort of stuff. I said, no, Joyce, well, the problem is with your computer, and I want to put a bid in, but I've, I've run out of budget for this year, and I've got to I ask the other chair, how much is it? And she bought the laptop there and then. She just bought it. She said, I'll pay for it, Steve. Go and get a decent one. You see, what I thought was going to be another telling off, what I thought was going to make me seem small, that wasn't her intention. Her intention was, don't be too flippant in the pulpit, Steve, because it'll put people off. She was trying to help me be better at public speaking. That was her heart, not to cause me problems. We need to be people who can communicate in such a way that we don't take offence easily, but nor are we people who slander each other. And if we've wronged Christians, if we have slandered them, if we've said things that aren't right, we need to go and we need to make amends for that. Because Satan is looking for every opportunity to knock those bricks out the wall. What are we to be like? Well, we are to crave. I love that phrase. Because it doesn't say they're newborn babies quite like milk. Does it? It doesn't say newborn babies need a bit of milk every now and then. They crave it. Now, my three girls are here, okay? So I'm probably going to get stick for this in the, in the car on the way home, okay? But hopefully she's not paying attention. The third one was more difficult, right? Because at meal times there were two to look after. And one of them wasn't the most coordinated of children and knocked stuff over regularly. So there was one incident where, yes, they're all pointing at which one's which. Um, there was one incident where, where Tabitha was just a little baby in this Moses basket and there was a problem and, and Abby and I were dealing with it and Tabitha just wanted to be fed. And she just wanted her milk and she started to fuss and, then she, and her whole body went red and she just started to scream because she craved that milk with her whole body. I think next year she'll probably calm down and forgive us for that, but we are still waiting. Um, but, you know, as soon as, as soon as Abby fed her, the whole situation changed. But it's, that's the picture. They're to crave pure spiritual milk. Why? So they may grow in their salvation. So, so in the milk, what is the context? Well, we've just been talking, haven't we, in the previous verses, about the words of God. Now, primarily that means the Bible. Primarily that means Scripture. But, but if Scripture is when we're talking to someone, when we do that one-to-one, -one, open the book, and we're discussing Scripture, that's discussing the words of God. If it's a song, a good Christian song, based on the Bible, those are nourishing things for you. If you read good Christian spiritual books, that is helpful. I, I, the reason I put a pizza up there is, let me talk about um, Christian literature for a moment. Cr Christian literature is like a ready-made pizza. Okay? It's nice. You can just pop it in the oven, you get it out, and you get quite a nice pizza. Okay? But we need to be people who know how to, need to make, make the pizza ourselves. So if you just eat ready-made pizza, you, you don't know, oh, hang on, there are different flower bases I can add in here. Mushrooms? You can put mushrooms on it? I didn't know there were mushrooms. Pineapple, there's no need for that. Um, you know, a barbecue base instead of tomato base. Oh, I love it. We need to be people who know the recipe ingredients and how those go together, not just be receiving a ready-made pizza that we just consume. Nice and as useful as they are, we need to be people who understand so all of Scripture is God-breathed. Useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I was doing a talk about ooh, three months ago, and I mocked Revelation, uh, um, 
Lamentations. I just thought, oh, it's really hard to get into, blah, blah, blah. The next four talks, the key verse that God gave me was right in the middle of Lamentations, wasn't it? I have some of that, Steve. That's what you need. That's really good, that one. Speak on that. It's all useful. Some of it's hard to wrestle with. Some of it needs a bit of work. Some of it is difficult to, to, to just read through. But all of it is useful for us. And all of it is useful for what? Teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. What's that? That's what we've been talking about tonight. That's what we're to do with each other. That's what we're to model for each other. We're to hold each other to account. Please don't all come back to me at the end of the sermon and don't tell me, not, you know, give me a little tip. But spread it out over a week or two. Um, but we are to be some, a group together who are trying to work together to be useful spiritual stones for Christ. I was involved in a, a difficult conversation at work and, and one of the, the youth group leaders um, that was um, on the same sort of level uh, as I was um, had moved in with a, with a girl. So, so I stood them down from leading. And I got, I got pushback from certain people. And I was called into a meeting and, and I said... Um, well, that's, it's not okay. <laughs> well, we've got to love everybody. Yes, but if they're not living as Jesus wants to, the loving thing is to point that out to them. <sighs> and then someone said, well, we've got couples in the church that uh, you know, aren't, aren't married. I said, well, you shouldn't. All three of those couples have married in the last year. Because a lovingly gracious way of holding the church to account modelling, even though it's difficult, even though this is going to cost us a really good thing, they're not going to be able to have the same role they had. Come along, be involved, but they're not going to be held up as this is how we want Christians to live. The teaching then went through, people wrestled with it, people discussed it, and all three of those couples in the church are now married and living for Christ. We need to be people who aren't scared to hold each other to account because we so crave this book that it just spills out into how we treat and how we talk to others. We need to rid ourselves of the rubbish and crave the good. Rid ourselves of the rubbish and crave the good. Let's speak to God, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for coming into this world, for dying for us, for allowing us to be set aside and to be holy. Father God, we thank you that you are the Holy One. Thank you that you want to be called Father and you want us to be born again into your family. Father God, thank you that salvation isn't a work of us. As Lewis spoke this morning, you do all the work for us. You're the one who has made a way for us to be right with you. But help us not to put on the rubbish of the world, not to emulate our community and our society, but help us to get rid of hypocrisy, malice, envy, and slander of all kinds, Lord. Father God, please help us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Steve. We're going to move into a time, <coughs> excuse me, sitting there silently for a bit of time, you, you lose... Uh, we're going to move into time of communion, um, and I'm going to jump around the Bible a little bit, just in terms of introducing a few things. Lots going through our head. The songs that we've sung this evening have spoken so clearly about what communion is, what the Lord has done for us. Uh, the reading that we had 